I'm Ben. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm one of... Hello. Um, I'm one of the uh, directors of the film and producer. Um, I'm, I'm Chuck. I'm doing the publicity and helping with distribution for the film and uh, also working on the, the website project that the students you saw in the film have set up. Um, well, you're Paul, so they yeah, know. Yeah. The, 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 um, session. My name is uh, Theo Goggen. Um, I'm a writer of the film together with Terry Jones. Um, so everything that's funny in the film is from Terry. <laughs> um, everything that's completely uh, nonsense or that you didn't understand, that's uh, my part. Or boring. Uh, <laughs> or boring. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's. Uh, and and I, um, I decided with Terry that we. Um, I, Decided we wanted to make a documentary about the financial crisis, especially because of... Um, it's not working, is it? Can you hear me, everyone? Yes. Oh, oh no, now it's working. So, maybe because this is... The, the, why we started the film is because um, I'm a very frustrated economist uh, and working both as a professor uh, in Amsterdam, but also in practice. Um, working for and with pension funds and they used to work for banks in the past and to me it, it doesn't make sense what they taught me uh, when I was 25 years ago uh, at the universities and it, it got worse and worse because over the years all this this new classical nonsense that you see in the film became law so when I was using my brains when I was younger and I said well this is what I think can happen with the economy people said no 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 you have to make these calculations based on statistics and they said, no, 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 because when things go very smooth and when markets become calm, uh, people uh, become overconfident. Then you see these statistics becoming very smooth and, and, and low, low risk in, in the world. And, and people can take more risk. And that's, but the risks are increasing. And I, I told it to when I worked at ING, I said, this is going the wrong way. I said, no, 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 we have to follow these rules. And, um, and even 10 years later, it was still the case. And it, it, it didn't change. So... Uh, you can write about it whatever you want, but you can better make a film. And because I met Terry seven or eight years ago, um, and we decided uh, this was the right moment to do something. And I already made before a small film with uh, Ben and Terry uh, called Risky Business and the Business of Risk, with all kind of jokes, uh, Monty Python things together with some new sketches. And so that's how it all happened. By the way, he, when he showed the film at, at your university, uh, the rest of the economics professors uh, tried to get you removed. Uh, they, they actually wrote a letter saying you should be taken off and shot. But they, they walked out of the film, and uh, so they, was, <laughs> they walked out of the room, and then they wrote a letter to the vice chancellor, the director, and they said, this film will make students very uncomfortable. <laughs> and the vice chancellor said, well, that's exactly the, 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 the reason for science. And, and, and so they, they were shut down immediately because this guy supported me, and, uh, fortunately. But I, but I told them when I, I joined the university that I would make a lot of, a lot of noise about education because it's, it's really, to me, uh, unbelievable what they, they teach me, us. And thank you, Paul, for yes. being in the film, <laughs> yes. because you know, your role was fantastic. And, uh, well, we had lots more material, and we could have made we always do. five hours of film. But yeah. this was I, I mean, what, one, of, one response I would make is that, I mean, I'll, one of the reasons I wrote the current book that, I'm, that I talked about earlier is because I wasn't satisfied with the, the explanation that's in the film. Uh, because, because I think it, the explanation is right, i.e. the injection of the Minsky uh, financial instability hypothesis. I first heard of Minsky because of George Magnus's work before, George Magnus also predicted uh, the crash and he, dis, he, he coined the phrase the Minsky moment in mid-2007 when we'd actually begun to realise that it was going to implode. But there is, for those of us who are critics and we can you know, rub the faces of the kind of enemy in, as you do so well in there. One of the things we have to talk about and admit is this. My background is political economy. So it's not economics. I don't have an economics degree, but I have effectively, I'm a, a political, a, a, a hist economic history with a class analysis. That's what political economy is. But, and, and also of everybody in that movie, I'm pretty certain, except for Magnus, who's got a slight political left background, I am the only one who studied in depth Marxist economics. And so when I say this, this is what I say. Look, the problem is Marxist economics is incomplete. 
And those of us who want, if you want the full story, it is, it starts at a very high level of modelling, actually, abstract modelling. of it, it, it models reality in a very abstract way. And Marx believed that he could, over time, move from an abstract model to a, uh, a model of an, a society where, where you've got uh, heavy industry, light industry, banking. In Capital Volume 3, which is published after his death, he introduces banking and, in, in fact, financial crisis. There's a brilliant explanation of financial crisis in the third volume of Das Capital. But that's not enough. The kind of economics you need if you want to run ING or uh, Siemens or whatever is an economics that explains price movement. And Marx did not produce one. He wanted to, and his own followers spent 100 years grappling with the problem of how this abstract model that you've produced, Carl, actually explains price movements. And because in the 1960s, a Japanese economist uh, and a whole school of Japanese economists kind of thought they proved that it was impossible for the Marxist system to explain price, you, you get this permanent dis dissociation. And so where is, why can't you have, why can't Lee's Beckett have uh, an economics department full of people who, who not only explain crisis, but where it comes from, because, the, because political economy is incomplete. And I think we have to in inject that much though we can actually ridicule the, the economics of stability and, and, yeah. and, 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 and uh, you know, rational markets. It, it is the, the fact that we haven't produced an economics that replaces it. For those kids, for those students, they, you know, that's what they need. But um, maybe to, to comment on that, um, what I really like in these days, and you mentioned it already, is the, uh, the, we, we know that the economy is about people, it's social science and how people interact with each other. And you now have these theories of uh, complexity, bottom-up modeling about how people, uh, agents, uh, work with each other, how they change their minds gradually mm -hmm. over time when they see markets go up for, for a period of time and then they want to buy a house as well. So on a micro level, things gradually change a little bit and that produces enormous effects on a macro level. And we can model that now with computers. Mm -hmm. But then you know what economists say, and this is really annoying, and that, that's really... My, my point, then they tell me, you can't predict with these models. Well, we can't predict, we can never predict. People want to predict, we wanted to predict uh, 10,000 years ago when we looked at the stars and now they still want to predict. We can only have a little bit of an ID mm -hmm. about how, how economics works and if we do a little bit with this uh, policy, we change <coughs> the world a little bit, make it more stable or more unstable, that's the only thing we can do, but we cannot predict. Everyone who's predicting things about financial markets or where, of course, Steve Keen and, and, and Magnus, they predicted that the markets were unstable and there's something this couldn't last for forever, just like you're predicting something about uh, the um, <coughs> capitalism and post-capitalism, but you're not saying tomorrow we will have 3% more mm. of this or mm. that's all a joke and that's, that's what we, they teach us at the universities, they teach you to be a forecaster mm. where you can't be. Mm. That, that's, uh, mm. I, I mean, another story I would throw in is that I mean, this is, I think it's, it's public, but so, so Keynes, you know, Keynes obviously taught and, and, and lived in Cambridge, but the only Keynesian economists in Cambridge are the Department of Land Economics, which is weird because that, that's, a, it's almost a development department, you know, land economics means the agrarian society. And when, and, and these guys are not Marxists, they're not even Minskians, they're just Keynesians. And when they tried to teach Keynes on the course, um, there was an in, interest, there was a rebellion of a different kind because they they started they, they tried to teach economic history and Keynesianism, demand management, etc. And uh, and quite they told me quietly all these students started to come around the kind of tutorial system round to the back and say, why are you doing this? Why are you trying to teach me this? Because. All I want to be is a quantitative anal analyst in the city. And, and you're just wasting my time. Quants, quants want yeah. to know models, like you used to say, say that, that can encapsulate complexity and crisis, but we don't want a historical understanding of capitalism. It's no, of no use to us in getting the job. Yeah. Absolutely. I guess, Ben, do you want to talk a little bit about oh, why oh. you wanted to make this as a film? <laughs> Just thinking, because we've got you here speaking for the Centre of Culture and the Arts, and this is so heavily economic and political. So what kind of creative element did you see in, you know, really dense economic theory? Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm a bit out of my depth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, 
I mean, we, we, we came to it as filmmakers, so we, ha we have no, um, I have no economics background, okay. and that, that was, I mean, really, you know, Teo and, um, and Terry kind of wrote the script, uh, and we took, took it on from there. So I think we came from a position where we had no, no, no basis for this, and obviously started to suck up as much as we could um, to start to work out how to make it, ultimately, for us, entertaining. Um, but what we found very quick, well, obviously to get across the concepts and ideas that, that, that you know, these brilliant people that we interviewed um, and obviously brilliant people here with me uh, talk about and discuss. But what we found was um, it was incredibly difficult. Economics, uh, we would sit and watch back, you know, countless, even with people who are brilliant at explaining it, um, it would take us, you know, hours of re-watching what they're saying until we could actually really fundamentally deliver it to, to ourselves before anybody else, and we were really the audience. Um, and so for us, the, the challenge was trying to make a film which ultimately anybody could watch and grasp these ideas and not be turned off or bored to tears. Um, Terry obviously helped hugely, his sketches, his ideas, the, the comedy, all of that, you know, the South Park guys gave us their footage, all that sort of stuff helped. Um, but I remember the editing was painful beyond belief. The hardest thing I've ever had to do. Literally the hardest. No, there was no, there's no doubt about it. So I'm, I'm moaning. It's a moan. I've just winged. Oh, we'll get the violin guy out, the puppet. He's my favourite. Is the harder thing going forward not actually Chuck's job, though? Oh. in terms of <laughs> carrying this forward because we had open economics we had rethinking economics um, and post crash here today doing economic boot camp with our uh, delegates and they were giving us a little insight into your job which is how you carry forward boom bust into a project of education and did they talk about it they did great we saw your yeah. website and everything <laughs> yeah it's 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 a massive challenge because what they're trying to do and what we're trying to do is make economics interesting to everybody and most people might be interested in politics but maybe not economics and the the other day I was I went to Waterstones the massive flagship Waterstones in Piccadilly in London and I went to the economics section which is it's it's about half the width of this table it's <coughs> it's so small and and the books in there are either aimed at academics, they're just texts once you start university, or they're books for people with an existing interest in economics. So, you know, called things like The Armchair Economist or whatever, trying to make it accessible. But if you're not interested in <coughs> economics and you do think it's dry, then you're not going anywhere near that section. So nobody really, apart from that, kind of those two niche markets, nobody really is interested in it. I actually cornered a woman who was browsing, um, and I just said, but, you know, wh why, why are you here? And, uh, and um, she was there to buy a book on, on Yanis um, Varoufakis, and she said she was interested in, in politics, and I said, are you interested in economics, and would an understanding of economics make your life better in any way? And she said, well, no, not, not at all, because that's just about making money. She said, that's, you know, it's just not an interesting subject. So immediately there, there's a huge... There's the majority of the population who have no interest in economics and therefore no way of cutting through the jargon and understanding that it's not just up to experts and it's something that we all do. And we figured out that economics is sort of, it's, it's, it's seven billion stories all happening at the same time. It's choices and decisions and experiences. It's not, you know, it's not maths. It's not, it's not a science. It's not these kind of dry mm. things mm. that put people off. And... And it's, everyone's doing it anyway. You might as well understand it. And I, I'm, I'm actually the only person on the team who has no idea what they're talking about. So they run things past me, and if I get it, then it's, <laughs> then it's all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, a brilliant, it's a brilliant project. It's ambitious, but it's really necessary. I mean, yeah. the focus is very much on trying to break this neoliberal hold on the way economics is taught, and um, it's a huge challenge. Um, yeah, and to make it more diverse so it's not like we don't want to just <coughs> replace doctrine no. with another doctrine it's not we really just want mm. students who go into these jobs in the city as you say as we say in the film to be able to have a broader yeah. understanding or at least you know sorry yeah ex exactly i mean it's not about uh replacing neoclassical theory with, with paul mason uh, that would be great <laughs> of course but uh, <laughs> 
uh, but I, there is no debate in economics, and all these politicians and all the, the, the leaders in the central banks, they have one single theory, and that's how, what they apply. And when it's wrong, then, uh, I mean, if you assume something, like uh, there's a road and there's uh, no hole in the road, so I can drive 200 miles an hour, but if you assume this, but there is a hole in the road, then you're dead. I mean, and that's what Mr. Draghi is saying, whatever it takes, uh, we're going to do this. Uh, that's unbelievable. I mean, if, uh, from, uh, if, if we will look back at history and say, well, how, how can people make these kind of comments? But they do. They, they just bet on something and they hope it will work. And if it doesn't work, it's terrible. And, and that's the economics that we live in now. And if you have more mm -hmm. diversity, that's mm -hmm. much... I leads think, to a more stable world, I, I think. I think for Norbert, certainly for us, it was astonishing that it's taught like this. Mm -hmm. It was just made no sense. Just makes no but, sense to me. But, but I, I would argue that we have a, we have a, parallel, we have a couple of parallels. I'll, 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 one of them is the Copernican moment in science. So, you know, he, he writes in 1512, you know, the sun's at the centre of the universe. And it takes a while, between, well, obviously, you know, it, it, uh, a while till you get Galileo to, that says, hold on a minute, it might, that might be even more complicated. But the moment of breaking is, is important. The other one is that, that the, I don't understand this fully, and I think, you know, the, that's because nobody quite understands what the outcome is. But you get this moment in, in, phys in physics in the late 19th century where, you, you know, uh, James Clark Maxwell you know, posits the idea of, of, of ether to explain the pro some of the problems that later uh, end up as the theory of relativity and then the theory of, 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 of complexity and uncertainty. And, and you know, we're, if physics takes, you know, from the 1880s to sort of the 1920s, even to state and work through the problems, we are probably at the early phase of that. Yeah. We're, we're actually... So behavioural economics, you know, comes in as you've tried. You know, the psychology of economics. It's it's important that we that we in, in some sense recognise that we're in a broken situation yeah, rather than just rush to try and say what fills the void of neoliberalism. Absolutely. So we must be very humble, and that's I think all these students understand it. If you're very humble, that you don't know, we don't even understand uncertainty. I mean, I was taught that things were uh, has had a normal distribution, because normal distributions, we all learn them at school, they are very comfortable, you can, you can uh, work with them, and, and I was very good at math, so uh, I did very well. Um, but then I found out that accidentally uh, the whole financial world didn't work that way, but uh, you, well, we were working with it anyway, so shut up. And uh, <laughs> so that, that uh, mm. and then he said, no, what, do you want to replace it? I mean, it's, I said, it's totally wrong, do we agree? Yeah, we agree, it's totally wrong. So, but if you don't have an alternative, we continue with it, and, and that's where we are now. And we do have alternatives, and they're not, uh, they don't give uh, an answer like um, in the, uh, was it the Hitch Hitchhiking Guide to the Galaxy, uh, 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 of, of, about uh, how happy we are, that was 42 or something. And I mean, that's what we want, they want to know 42, but we don't know. We don't, and, uh, but that's, it, it is, they can't, this is physics envy that they want to produce numbers and results that are very, <coughs> clear and, and, and um, calculable, and, and that's not how the world works. Well, that's I, think, I think that's dominated how people view economics now in the general public. They see it as numbers, physics, quantitative, I don't know, you know, it's all, and I, and I think it's trying to change that perception is what we're trying to do with the film a bit, with puppets. <laughs> <laughs> and with the website. And with the website. And with the website. The website is essential. We had a really nice preview today and some shocking statements from students, current economic students across the UK, um, mainly just saying in terms of the feedback they've had on their assignments, things like critical thinking not necessary at this level from current <laughs> undergraduate assignments, which, yeah, was, when, was surprising for us. It went, when we, we showed it recently in Bristol and there was an economic student there for, and he said this was the first time he'd ever heard the word bubble. <laughs> I said that. I was like, what? At my university, there were people, um, um, so they, they hired some people on behavioral economics, and the other people at the department said, no, we don't like behavior, this is the economics department. So behavior is not part of economics. <laughs> I mean, this is serious. I mean, it's uh, 2015, it still happens. Wow, can you fill our shocked silence with some questions, please? <laughs> Can our two roving mics up the steps, please? Can we start off over here? I think uh, a lot of what you're talking about actually has been played out in another area of philosophy, and it's, it's essentially 
our inability to have a criticism of rational, rationalism as a philosophy. So that's being played out now in our, in our education. We're, we're suffering from a rational education. We're yeah. suffering from a rational government. And mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. the way it works out in history is that because of the success of the natural sciences, because of rationalism, it was then applied to human beings. And obviously, by the time we got to the early part of the 20th century, it was showing it wasn't working out. Mm. So similarly as what you're saying with economics, rationalism doesn't work with human beings. Absolutely. And we keep yeah. on trying to Absolutely. make yeah. it work, and it doesn't. So many of your comments tonight actually reflect on that. And I guess the question that comes out of that is, is it ever possible to rationalize what is going to be an economic system based on rationalism with human beings? Yeah. So rationalism and economics, is it possible? Yeah, well, well I, I think we'll be, if you look at the world, work of Kahneman, the Daniel Kahneman, all these other people, you know uh, more or less how we, we can gradually go, um, and you literally say it in the film, from, from, um, from a little bit rational to collectively irrational. And if you can um, understand the, these processes, and if you can, for example, uh, model them a little bit in complexity models to see how, at least to have an impression how instability occurs, then you can at least try to put a break on, uh, for example, debt creation uh, and those kind of things to stabilize the economy a little bit. So it, does, it will never be a, a science that will be able to, uh, to predict the, the entire society, but it, it can help dealing with, on a rational way, like, like Kahneman says, if we, if we really think with a group of people in an institution, we can at least try to avoid the consequences of irrational behavior of people. I'm, I'm not sure if that makes it a, a rational science. Or well, I just wonder if the, the problem is back with just what you said, the institutions that promote this kind of thinking. And that, as you found out yourself, it's almost impossible yeah. to critique rationalism. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, the, 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 if you go back to study what replaced political economy, what replaced Smith, Ricardo, Marx, was Mar marginalism. So, you know, neoclassicism is an out out outgrowth of the marginalist revolution of the 1870s. So, Karl Menger, Wal Leon Walras, and, and William Stanley Jevons all at the same time discovered a way of, of describing price movements and, and, and predicting the movements of markets. This is an advance, actually, in, in economics. It's something that we have to respect as an advance. But it went alongside uh, the, the, the ad adoption. Of an ideal, of an, a normative ideolog ideological rationalism, as you say. Now, I'm not against rationality applied to to to, to reality, but what there's a critical idea in marginalism in the 1870s, and I think it's Veng Wenger who actually says it. Th this is this is this is the problem. Marx and Smith and Ricardo and Malthus all basically said the economy works behind the backs of human beings. It has laws we can't control. Um, and when, whether it's the market or a crisis or the Marxist view of labour as, as, as imparting value. Wenger says, this is tantamount to saying the human race are like animals. The, the, it's like a zoological view that the, that, that, that the human race are just going along, expressing the will power of a, of a higher pre-programmed reality that we can't control. This is wrong, says says the, the founder of marginalism, it has to be rational, that, we, that, 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 that man is a higher being and his rationality is imposed on economics through the market. And they, they, you just trace it right back to there, that's what probably every economics department believes, that, the, that, that man's ration, or human, humanity's rationality can control the mar reality and it does so through the market. But we, we know from, from the last few decades that we can, uh, that people have persistent biases, that we make decisions with mm. our old brains, mm. eh, with our limbic system that, mm. uh, and that goes back to, to these animals, so we, we make decisions like animals, and uh, mm. I mean that, that's, that's good, but the people don't like that, so they, they say, no, no, we're all rational, but if, if it comes to decision making, we're totally uh, not rational, and mm. uh, the only rational thing we can do is observe it. And make a system around it that protects us from 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 the worst mm. consequences. That's mm. 
Okay, question up here. Thank you very much. I very, I very much enjoyed the film. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Thank you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> the, big, the big sort of thing is to say, okay, economics is based on people's behaviour, not taking into account. One of the other bits of human behaviour seems to me sort of selfishness or corruption. And most economists say you need a non corrupt society for economics to work. And we seem to be getting more and more corruption, which is another example of people's behaviour. Um, do you think that's just a side issue, or is this another sort of aspect of, of human behaviour, and there are more to come that we haven't taken into account, which affect the economics more than we thought? In other words, there's not any rationality in bad decision-making, but perhaps other ways that people behave, which will, over time, we find out they have big economic effects. Is that the sense of the yeah. question? Yeah. 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 Um, Yes, it is a sensible question. Uh, I, I mean, just thinking back, so we had a whole section in the film about corruption, um, which, we, which we actually took out. Um, and we took it out because, uh, well, could, could, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, so you might have to help me, but um, it, was, it, was a, it was a result of the, of the irrational, it was a, it was a result of the, of, the, of the exuberance of the, that was, but it wasn't. It didn't feel like it was a cause. Is the way I sort of saw it, and um, I didn't want it to detract from mm. the main point. Mm. Whereas, and, and it was a shame because actually there were some fantastic stories, right? <laughs> I mean, there's just brilliant stuff which which you can just which are literally. We were just talking about it. You can literally just just the, the, through history they do exactly the same things. I mean, it, all the way back to the you know way way back, the corruption is the same. The, the mm. process is the same. The ideas are the same. So. And they and and every every fall. I mean, we were just talking about the weird thing about um, Madoff. You know, the, the mm. only person, the only one, amazing, who got done in some way. Um, and there was another. I can't remember actually who we, it was in our. It was in our section. There was another um, guy who was because was was you have to help me. Madoff yeah. was the. Madoff was the, the uh, he ran the uh, at some point he ran the uh, New York Stock Exchange, exchange I yeah. think or one, one exchange and in, and in the 1930s there was another guy I can't remember his name now it was in the it, he he was all, that's right and he the also 20s. ran the New York Stock Exchange and also did the biggest <laughs> corruption in virtually the same way <laughs> but if Just you go back, if you go back to um, John Kenneth Galbraith what, what he <coughs> said I think that's that's why we 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 didn't think it dominates but it always uh, comes with a, uh, a boom when there's a boom and people become euphoric and there's a lot of land uh, uh, borrowing and lending and, and money creation and debt creation then there's increasingly fraud and, and that comes with it, it, it so it, it triggers the wrong people to yeah. do the wrong things because they uh, relax regulations it's a, it's a judgment that, that that we made together with John Gannon Galbraith that uh, it's it's a byproduct a terrible byproduct of euphoria hmm. um, but it's not the single cause of a debt crisis I mean it's not if, if there were no uh, crooks no battles that there wouldn't have been a debt crisis yeah. uh, so it's, it's, it's actually a brilliant it's, indicator that we're on our way yeah, to the Usually then we're too late. Yeah. I, I, think, I think as well that there's two kinds of corruption in the system. The, the, the corruption that, that takes place at the... Uh, and even, again, you go back to this one page in Marx, uh, in volume three, where he says, you know, and financial manias, at the end of them, they're, they're actually dominated yeah. by crooks. Because it, it, when it becomes logical simply to take part in the mania, then all kinds of you know, unknowing people just just get, get caught up Absolutely. by crooks. Madoff is a good example. But look, the, also, the, the, the incentive is to hide losses. So we see in, in yeah. Lehman, we, you know, nobody's gone to jail for this, so the way we have to describe it has to be a bit careful. But you know, uh, Repo 105 was the, the tactic that Lehman used to move assets off the balance sheet at the end of every quarter. Um, they simply move them off the balance sheet. The, 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 uh, the, uh, the lawyer who was asked to look into this by the US regulator, Anthony Volucas, phoned this. He, in the report, just moves off the balance sheet. That it's deemed uh, solvent, and then you know, the day it's deemed solvent, they move it all back onto the balance sheet, and it's technically insolvent for about three quarters before yeah. they go bust. So that's another kind. But we can't. But the, the thing I would say is that 
in my professional life, you know, I move through the circles of, you know, the, the large consultancies, large accountancy firms, large hedge funds, etc. And the, the, the world, you know, behind the scenes, these guys are dealing with, and lawyers, serial, serial crookedness, yeah? And except the problem is, is that they, they can go home at night and sleep because they can at least say, we went and tried to sort of, you know, not so much exposed, because they're never exposed. The crooks are never jailed, but they actually are there, you know, you know, they're caught, as it were. They are, the, the, the mistakes are caught, and they are, the system kind of, like white blood cells, kind of attacks them. Yeah. I mean, there is a guy called Dan Ariely, and he... Uh, he's in the film. He, yeah. He's in the film, and he wrote his books, uh, The Honest Truth About Dishonesty. And he looks about, if, if you make people do games uh, with, with real money, there, and, and ask them questions about how much... Uh, what the percentage was they were right and in questions. They, they are very honest. But when you make it more with, with uh, more tokens, things like which are more abstract, and in the end you have to change the tokens into money, so it's more tokens or interest rates or something else, then they start to lie, and they lie more and more and more. So it's also a, it's extremely interesting what Daniel Ariely is, is doing. It's understanding how our uh, moral behavior changes with abstract money, and I think people in the bank, they were dealing, these guys, the mortgage broker mm -hmm. in the bank, they're dealing with abstract money, and it becomes more and more abstract, and mm -hmm. they don't think they're crooks, and they don't think they, they, they really had bad intentions, but they, it's a gliding scale, and, and they become <coughs> crooks, or semi-crooks, or whatever uh, you call it. Okay, we have time for one more question over here. Good evening, so I am an economist here, I'm not a financial economist, and I'd like actually to uh, raise you know, your attraction towards the fact that actually have plenty of different economists. Paul well, Mason touched it a little bit on this, that actually it's true. People who like macroeconomics, usually, they are not interested in anything else than the finance aspect of it. Myself, I'm a health economist, and I do really think that what I do is actually useful, mm. and I really make decisions. Then, of course, you cited several um, Nobel Prizes here. But actually, we did have Nobel Prizes who did look into the irrationality. If you take Baker, yeah. for example, who looked into actually the addiction model, then actually they were taking into account the fact that actually people might act in a way that is irrational. So I think that's important. Then you think about Grossman, the very last actually uh, Nobel Prize. He's someone who has been working actually on topics that are really related yeah. to understanding what people are doing. And then I do really think that there are a lot of heterodox, heterodox economists at the moment, several departments. So if the Manchester student wants to come to the University of Leeds, not the Beckett one, there is actually a lot of it there with us. I'm not sharing opinions with them, but I do really think that actually there are people doing heterodox economics. And yeah, it's not easy to put everyone in the same basket. Thank you. So there are other models, and Leeds was actually raised today as a good example of a more progressive way of yeah. teaching economics. Have you guys come across any other positive examples of change? Yeah, we not. Because I want to react to this, that I'm, I'm not denouncing the universities, where they, I mean, these guys walked out of the room, uh, my university, but th those are really uh, hardcore neoclassical people. Um, but there are lots of people who do more pluralism and, 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 and want to introduce more diversity. And, and there are, uh, I mean, it goes back to Herbert Simon and, and, and uh, m many more people in the past who were uh, working on irrational or non-optimizing behavior. So the Nobel Prize winners, some of them are in the neoclassical campus, some of them are in, in, in the, the more, di I won't call it heterodox, but the more diverse area. But the, the policy makers in the world and the way we got, uh, we applied uh, politics uh, based on economic theory in the 1990s and 2000s was all based on neoclassical theory, rational people, uh, people didn't make a mistake, you could reduce um, well, all the things that were in the film, eh? reduce the regulations. It was all based on this top-down, rational people, equilibrium. Um, so I agree. I don't want to offend people who do the right things, but these people are not in, 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 in power today, and that's the problem, I think. But also, in terms of uh, departments, we, we wanted to make a, a map, not a shaming map, but a, a, a pluralism map of of universities who are, you know, offering a kind of a broad and critical approach and a pluralist curriculum and just try to get an idea of 
which countries are really excelling and which ones are lagging behind and just make this something that people can actually see as a, you know, as a, as a global movement. Um, we asked uh, Rethinking uh, what they thought about that and apparently there's a project in Germany um, where they've, I think, been working for about seven years on researching this map. So it's in the, it's in the offing, but it will take some time to actually create it. But there's certainly some who are really leading the way. And I, bearing in mind what I've said about the incompleteness of critical economics, number one, obviously apply, applied microeconomics, that's the other thing. The, the, I, you know, I, without, again, naming a lot of names, I really, I, 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 I think a lot of, not behavioural economics, but was, as we might call um, funky microeconomics, has been a really, de it was the last thing that neoliberalism did. It's sport, you, you, the big boys run, you know, you know Villain Boiter is in your film, you know, but he's not an heterodox economics from my, no, 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 from no. my point of view. You know, he says some nice things about Minsky, but he was one of the people who steered us into the iceberg, yeah? Now, people like Boiter, Boiter will go from the Bank of England to what was he for, then UBS, that was, where was the place? Then he gets himself another job there, and they go from one to another, and they make some critical points, but their essential economic theory remains the normative one. The, the, no, what, do you, what would you need to do do to, to, to put this right. You need to actually open up some of the big chairs in the prestigious universities to heterodox economists. Haldane is probably the most heterodox yeah. economist in any position of power. But even he, he momentarily got his hands on the financial regulation mechanism, the Bank of England. But oops, he's moved back to economics uh, to think some nice thoughts. He has no power. The next thing is you need some, I think that the, the, the banks are now full of people looking at alternative models because they don't want to lose their money again. But it is, as you suggest, government, government macroeconomist. You know, it, you try and get, there's a concrete example. Um, Olivier Blanchard, the chief economist of the IMF, admitted that their model of, of austerity was wrong. That they, they've been saying that for every pound cut, only 50p is taken out of the economy. Whoops, they really looked at it. For every pound cut, one pound fifty is taken out of the economy. Right? What do you think the Office for Budget Responsibility in, in the UK Treasury, which one do you think they use? They use 0 0.5. And so they can sign off George Osborne's austerity plans every year and say, for every pound you cut, George, only 0 0.5, not only 50p worth of damage is done. Why? Because they're obliged to use the Treasury's economic model, and the Treasury's economic model is signed off every year by these, to be honest, you know, people who will never learn anything. And they, went to, they all went to Oxbridge. They're all incredibly good mathematicians and quants, but they do not accept anything that any of us on this platform is saying. So, dialogue and representation coming out as key themes there. I'm very sorry, but I've got to wrap up the evening because we have run out of time. But could you join me in thanking our panel, please?